This is a rock star in Alzheimer's. He's the clinical director of Pearl Barrel Clinic for Memory Evaluation Treatment, home of the Alzheimer's Disease Center, part of the Ken Langone Center for Cognitive Neurology, and one of the 30 disease research centers designated as National Institute of Aging. Board certified in psychiatric and neurology, board certified in pathology and neuropathology, a fellowship at the, uh, New York Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center in Neuropathology, a residency in NYU Medical Center, an MD from the University of London King's College, 400 peer-reviewed article, medical journal articles, 19 issued US patents. The guy is a legend. He's on the advisory board of Alzheimer's and wait till you hear what he says about our drug. There's no way anybody can deny what we have. This is amazing. If you care about this drug, if you care about treating Alzheimer's, you cannot miss this interview. And you need to pass this interview along to everybody you know who cares about Alzheimer's. And so obviously you know that Alzheimer's Neuro has sort of two paths we're going down. We're going down this, this co-crystal lithium salicylate uh, with proline, and then we have this immunotherapy path. What would something like AL001 mean to the market if you could treat bipolar, use the lithium safer, have a less toxic lithium, and potentially help with tau mitigation and Alzheimer's? That, that would be huge. The, the cost of caring for Alzheimer's disease patients uh, this year is expected to exceed $300 billion. Uh, and th those uh, costs are climbing that by 2050, the cost of taking care of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia will be $1.1 trillion. So that will bankrupt healthcare in the United States if a disease-modifying therapy is not found. So if lithium could be something in this formulation, that could be safely given that would affect how phosphorylation uh, pathology and Alzheimer's disease, that would represent a disease-modifying therapeutic approach. That would be huge. Alzheimer's disease is the only cause of death among the top 10 causes of death for which we have no effective means of treating or even slowing down disease progression. So uh, uh, th th this uh, lithium uh, uh, formulation has the potential promise to do that. And if in clinical trials that is substantiated, that, that, that would be a, a tremendous thing. Well, you almost, you almost, <laughs> you almost, you almost make me like, blown away by what you just said because I don't think people realize, the audience realizes, you know, with your family work and who you are and how thrilled we are to, to be associated with you in any way. When I read your background a year and some change ago, I actually thought it was like, I actually thought Jerry was kidding that you were going to come on our uh, advisory board. And I know we're a small kind of biotech, so we're, you know, we're scrappy and we're not probably what you're used to with some of the bigger companies out there. But um, as my, 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 my father has it, my mother-in-law died from Alzheimer's and, and the, the corresponding disease that, that came from that and, and uh, my grandparents did. And so mm -hmm. I, I, um, I know so many people that are affected by this. So I think the work mm -hmm. you're doing is amazing. And I don't know if the audience will realize what a rock star you are in Alzheimer's. Your daughter's a doctor. You come from a family of doctors. If I recall, both your parents were doctors. Am I correct there? Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, uh, bo both of them were uh, involved in different ways in uh, Alzheimer's disease research uh, as well. My father was a neuropathologist and my mother was a pediatric neurologist. They each made contributions to, to the field. I always tell you, I, I keep repeating myself that I'm not a scientist, but I had heard that the, some of the scientists that were involved in inventing this drug, this compound, actually used some of your research. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that true? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've done many, many studies in different Alzheimer's transgenic uh, mouse models, uh, which are um, very similar to uh, the way in which 
uh, lithium has been tested uh, in a variety of settings. And, and that, that, that's another uh, nice aspect of the preclinical work that's been done on lithium in that it's been tested in multiple Alzheimer's disease mouse models, uh, including the uh, TG2576, the uh, APPPS1 model, and the 3XTG mouse models. And uh, although uh, your listeners might not know anything about these different models, each of the mouse models of Alzheimer's disease mirrors different aspects of the human disease well. There's no single mouse model that mirrors everything exactly. But the fact that lithium treatment in these diverse mouse models that each are good for different aspects about Alzheimer's disease pathology showed beneficial effects, that that increases the probability that it, it would really have beneficial effects in people as well. So it, it's always a, 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 a useful and hopeful thing where you test out a therapeutic approach and it works in multiple model systems where you're getting corroboration of the therapeutic effects. So that type of result enhances your confidence that uh, when you go to testing it in people, it will be both safe and effective. But ultimately, those tests have to be done. Do you have an opinion? Uh, you may have already stated it on co-crystallization, the, 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 the technology behind it and the use of it. Yeah, it, it's being tried uh, in a variety of settings to produce more sustained release formulations of different medications. So it, it, it's something that, that is being used more frequently. It's a safe thing to do, and it's a very effective means to produce a more stable, sustained release of a particular uh, therapeutic agent. So uh, that, that, that's something that's well-studied and is highly applicable uh, the uh, use with lithium. You know, obviously there's an economic side to our business. And so we're, we've invested money in this, in, in the compound so far. And what I'm reading and seeing is, and you've already talked about it, the use of lithium across multiple um, diagnostic areas, obviously um, bipolar, suicidality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Currently, though, when you put people on the current lithium form, are you still blood testing them, or do you have another mechanism to, to know the, the, the therapeutic window in there and how much they can have? No, we're, we're blood testing them, yeah. And, and yeah, we also have to monitor uh, the, their uh, hemoglobin, the, the CBC, the, their renal function, their level of hydration. So it, it, the, putting patients on lithium, you do have to uh, do fairly close monitoring. So the, the, the issue of having a narrow, narrow therapeutic window becomes much more key in people with cognitive problems where, you know, we're, we're um, uh, discussing the potential use of this formulation of lithium. And, and it's very important that this crystal of the lithium uh, has a much wider therapeutic window with better pharmacokinetics. You're, you're much less likely to have uh, issues and uh, there's less need for uh, the close monitoring, although monitoring would still have to be done. In human trials of lithium, where th there was uh, quite an extensive trial done in uh, amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of like an early stage uh, of disease that can potentially go on to Alzheimer's disease. Patients treated with low doses of lithium progressed less frequently to Alzheimer's disease. And there was actually a reduction in the levels of this hyperphosphorylated tau protein in the treated individuals. The caveat uh, is that it has to be in a formulation that will be safe and not be potentially associated with the many 
side effects of high levels of lithium uh, that, that there are. And uh, the uh, ionic co-crystal formulation uh, of lithium uh, it, it is something that does just that. It's a formulation uh, which should be more effective therapeutically and be safer to, uh, to give to patients because it has superior bioavailability and pharmacokinetic properties. So uh, it, it would still have the, the, the benefits uh, of uh, lithium, which have been well documented, but uh, with much reduced possibility of having those negative side effects. What do you think of us using lithium salicylate versus lithium carbonate? Well, so uh, currently uh, the lithium that, that's used is lithium carbonate or lithium citrate. And the problem with that formulation is that it leads to a, a quick high peak of lithium levels in the plasma, and then the levels quickly decline. So it needs to be given uh, much more frequently. And because you have those high peaks of lithium uh, with that formulation, you're much more likely to have toxicity. And the lithium has been well documented to have many beneficial effects, which are relevant for Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. It's not just with the tau-related pathology, but a major problem with its use in these settings is that at high levels, it has multiple toxicities. So uh, clinicians uh, uh, have been reluctant to pursue that avenue because of the worry uh, of, of the, that toxicity. But uh, again, if the lithium can be given in a more safe formulation where you have sustained therapeutic levels without those very high peaks and then the troughs, then uh, that, that's much more likely to be useful and, and uh, have applicability to Alzheimer's disease and indeed other neurodegenerative disorders. Yeah, it seems like from a, um psychiatric side of it too. It looks like, I mean, I read that there are still about 3 million plus subscriptions a year, prescriptions written for current lithium. And I wonder what you think about the possibility of using a lithium like this in, in the psychiatric side of the business. Uh, sure. treat, um, if, if, if it comes back that, that um, AL001 is less toxic and has a bigger therapeutic window, because so far we're seeing in the models, we're seeing a 48-hour window and, and no toxicity, or at least a lot less toxicity. I, I'm not a scientist, right, so I can't. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so sure, I, I think, you know, for those other more, I mean, the lithium has been used very effectively for treating bipolar disorder since the 1950s. And it, it's highly effective effective as a mood stabilizer in, in those sorts of settings, but it, it has to be very carefully monitored because there's always the, the, the risks of renal toxicity. And if the levels go up, there's pretty horrible uh, central nervous system toxicity with, with uh, uh, confusion, seizures, and, and uh, even death. Uh, so uh, it, it's a highly effective drug in those settings, but it, it, it has to be closely monitored to give safely. And, uh, you know, this formulation of uh, uh, lithium with the, the co-crystals promises to be just that. So I think if that becomes clinically available, it would be much better to use this formulation for those existing settings because it will be safer. It will need to be given less often it'll have sustained therapeutic levels in the plasma and in the brain. What's there not to like about that? I, I had a lot of talk with the University of South Florida, the inventor of the drug, um, and I apologize. Right. I'm not a scientific guy, and you know, I'm a Wall Street guy, and I don't exactly use the same terminology you do, although I do sure. have a med medical product background. That, you know, scientists won't say to you, 
hey, I wouldn't worry about the drug in human beings. But, and I don't think you could probably handicap this, but, you know, you're, we're using a, we're co an ionic co-crystallization, we're using lithium salicylate, we're using proline. How do you, how do you handicap the likelihood that that's going to be a problem in human beings? Because when I look at this, you know, my father has Alzheimer's and it, and it is really bad right now. And I, and I, I hate to say it, but I, I don't think anything we're doing is going to solve that for my father. But I really want to do something for my family members and, and future family members. And the more I look at this, it seems like to me, what could go wrong? So let's talk about what could go wrong. Uh, is, is lithium salicylate something that you as a doctor would worry about putting in patients? Is there something that, I'm, that I don't know because I'm not a scientist that I should be more aware of because of lithium salicylate? Uh, so it, it, it has to be tested for safety. But th this sort of formulation with the co-crystals, th there's no reason to suppose that there should be toxicity with the salicylate or the proline. Th those are well-studied compounds that uh, would be expected not to have any toxicity in, in people. So it, it would be, I think, quite unlikely that that formulation with uh, uh, th those co-crystals would be problematic, but uh, unexpected things sometimes happen. So th that's why one has to do uh, careful testing in the setting of clinical trials to, to verify that. If there's anything I can ever do for you, um, we, Thank we you are- Thank you I think we've had a useful conversation. Right, and I, and I appreciate, um, your feedback and uh, I'll, I'll be in touch. It was wonderful to talk to you. I thank you very much. You take care of yourself. Pleasure. Okay. Bye -bye.